The best way to keep wildlife with us is to allow the public access to them. Can you imagine preaching this philosophy at a time in our history when wildlife populations in North America were devastated by the abuses brought by the hands of man? Hi, I'm Shane Mahoney. This philosophy may be less of an issue today because we have brought back most species of wildlife to robust populations, especially the hunted species, mainly because the public has had access to them. However, there are those who still oppose hunting and fishing, believing wildlife would be better off if these activities did not exist. In this week's episode of Boone and Crockett Country, we will explore why we have the abundance of wildlife we have today and why we still have the opportunity to hunt. Because this story began over 100 years ago, and because all of us today have grown up with abundant wildlife and hunting, it is worth revisiting how we got here, what it took, and who was responsible. It is important if for no other reason than to protect the conservation system that saved our wildlife from those who today would have this system dismantled. The best way to save and keep wildlife with us is to allow public access to them. We could not have this conversation without acknowledging one man, Theodore Roosevelt. Boone and Crockett Country. Presented by Leupold, America's Optics Authority. Sam Walton, founder of Walmart and Sam's Club, once said, capital isn't scarce, vision is. All great men and women throughout history had one thing in common, vision. It took vision to sail into the unknown in search of a new world. It took vision to fight for independence and carve out a constitution for the people. It took vision to build the machines and the factories that turned this new world into a superpower. And it took vision to put a man on the moon. And it took vision to save us from ourselves. Theodore Roosevelt, the 26th president of the United States, was a man of vision. He combined vision with a relentless drive and an uncommon understanding and appreciation of the natural world to re-gift this country that which it had squandered. He once said, quote, optimism is a good characteristic, but if carried to an excess, it becomes foolish. We are prone to speak of the resources of this country as inexhaustible. This is not so, close quote. People who accomplish great things are not born with vision. Their vision develops through their interests what motivates them, and by what they are exposed to early in life. Roosevelt was no different. The first thing that influenced his vision was his health. A young Theodore Roosevelt was a sickly, asthmatic child. To overcome his frailness, he took to the gym to lift weights and box. He also took to the outdoors. The physical exercise improved his health, as did the fresh air. Being outside also fostered his appreciation for the wildness and struggles of nature, something he could relate to. In time, Roosevelt's fascination with nature led him to be an accomplished collector and taxidermist of birds at the early age of 14. Living the hardy, strenuous life as Roosevelt viewed it meant manly pursuits. He admired the soldier and duty to one's country, the pioneer and explorer willing to pit himself against the wilderness, the cowboy and the rancher busting broncos and carving a living out of the land, and the big game hunter testing himself against the elements and the great beasts. Roosevelt was fascinated with the West, but up until 1883, lived it only through every dime store novel, written account, or book he could consume. By age 24, he was already a Harvard undergraduate, a product of the Columbia Law School and a veteran member of the New York State Assembly. Determined to experience the West for himself, he stepped off a Northern Pacific train on September 7, 1883, in what is now known as Medora, North Dakota, then just known as the Badlands 
of the Dakota Territory. His purpose? To hunt buffalo before the market hunters exterminated the wild cattle of the plains. The Dakota Territory was the last region to hold fragments of what remained of the vast herds of bison. Its broken terrain of countless canyons and draws, unlike the wide open prairie, made extermination more difficult for the market gunners, who left this region as their last place to set up shop. With much difficulty, and days and nights in the saddle, Roosevelt and his hired guide were able to get the drop on one lone bull. The experience would change Roosevelt forever. For one, he in the West became one. Before returning to New York, he bought into a cattle operation. Secondly, Roosevelt was deeply disturbed with what he learned out about the great frontier. It was being bludgeoned to death by the progress of man. Deflated in spirit over what he previously had envisioned through his reading, he vowed to return. Boone and Crockett Country is in partnership with the Wild Sheep Foundation, putting and keeping sheep on the mountain, Buck Knives, knives that fit your life, and the Dallas Safari Club, promoting conservation and ethical hunting worldwide. After his Badlands hunting trip in 1883, Theodore Roosevelt returned to New York and his promising political career, only to be personally derailed in the winter of 1884, when on the same day, he lost his young wife and his mother, his wife to kidney failure and his mother to typhoid fever. Grief-stricken, Roosevelt abandoned the city life of an Easterner and returned to the only love he had left, the West and the hard ways of a ranchman. For the next three and a half years, he worked his Dakota ranch sunrise to sunset, side by side with his hired hands, building corrals and bunkhouses, breaking stock, hunting deer and antelope for meat, and devoting his nights to study and reading. During these years, he had the opportunity to further acquaint himself with the negative impacts of civilization upon the wild and scenic beauty of the West. The Northern Pacific Railway, that originally brought him had spread its steel fingers throughout the region. It brought with it the market hunters who systematically slaughtered what was left of the bison, reduced the bands of antelope, and nearly eliminated the bear, the deer, elk, and sheep. The railway also brought settlers and transient sportsmen who, in the absence of any legal check, took up the carnage where the market hunters left off, killing animals for meat, deriving sport from running up large bags of trophies or merely slaughtering grazing animals because they competed with livestock. To a sensitive naturalist like Roosevelt, this slaughter was repugnant. Wildlife abuse was not all he witnessed. Although Roosevelt relished the chase and took pride in a difficult shot, he rarely hunted except for meat or an exceptional trophy that he had seen. He also witnessed irresponsible abuses of the land, the use of fire, excessive timber cutting, and overgrazing left much of the land near where man lived vulnerable to rain and winds that eventually stripped the land of its topsoil. Great open gullies of mud from runoff rendered it unsightly and useless. The knowledge and motivations he gained while ranching helped shape his vision when he would later be called upon to make decisions for the entire nation. They also fostered an idea to form a society of sportsmen like himself, to take action, to correct the abuses he had seen that he knew were happening across the country. Invigorated from his time out west, Roosevelt returned to New York City. On December 7, 1887, he invited a handful of his friends to a dinner party. It was at this gathering where he first proposed the formation of an organization of sportsmen to spearhead an assault against the massive problems facing big game, public lands, and forest resources of the nation. Boone and Crockett Country is in partnership with the Pope and Young Club for the good of bow hunting, 
and the Guide Outfitter Association of British Columbia. Wildlife stewardship is our priority. As a career student of conservation and conservation history, I often ask myself why and how conservation was born on this continent. As a sportsman, I take great pride in knowing that the system of conservation we have today, the abundance of wildlife and wild places every citizen can enjoy, and our opportunity to hunt and fish, were given to us by sportsmen, just like you and me. These things we have today didn't just happen by chance. As for the birthplace of conservation, some would say it is the badlands of the Dakota Territory where Theodore Roosevelt developed his conservation ethic. Others might say it was the first meeting of the Boone and Crockett Club where the framework for conservation was hammered into place. Some would say conservation has no beginning or end and is born every day. All are true statements. One thing is for certain, it is impossible to cover all of the accomplishments and contributions of Theodore Roosevelt in only this half hour episode. Theodore Roosevelt's vision to form the Boone and Crockett Club in 1887 launched many things that became of lasting significance to this country and North America, much of which today remains unknown by the majority of citizens. While Roosevelt returned to his political ambitions, he and his fellow members in the club also embarked to carry out their mission. Before becoming president in 1901, the tally of sportsman-led deliveries were impressive. After Roosevelt took office, the dominoes for conservation really began to tumble. A Closer Look with Doug Painter, presented by Leupold, America's Optics Authority. When Theodore Roosevelt first traveled to the American West as a young man in the early 1880s, he saw firsthand the dire future many of our native wildlife species then faced. Gathering together some of America's most influential leaders, he formed the Boone and Crockett Club in 1887 to help fight for the future of America's big game. When Roosevelt became president just four years later, he and his Boone and Crockett members now had a powerful platform from which to advance critically needed conservation efforts. Although these men were hunters and were motivated to secure game for the future, they well understood that protecting remnant game populations was not enough. Appropriate habitat was also critical. Places where game could recover and thrive, protected from poaching and unwise land use. In just a few short years, the club's progress was remarkable. Landmark achievements included passage of legislation that paved the way for the first national forests in 1891. Passage of the Yellowstone Park Protection Act that put an end to the park being plundered by mining, timber removal, and poaching in 1894. The creation of the Flathead Forest Reserve that would become Glacier National Park in 1896. The passage of the Civil Service Appropriations Act, which allowed the president to claim federal lands as forest reserves in 1897. The establishment of the National Wildlife Refuge System in 1903. Passage of the Lacey Act, which marked the beginning of the end of commercial market hunting the establishment of game and fish regulations adopted by the states in 1902, the passage of the Migratory Bird Act in 1913. In many respects, the members of the Boone and Crockett Club blazed the trail for wildlife conservation in America. Thankfully, that's been a trail that over the years has been followed by millions of American sportsmen. Sportsmen, America's number one conservationists, it not only has a nice ring to it, it also rings true. Roosevelt's political career was running simultaneously with his stumping for conservation. When the Spanish-American War broke out in 1898, Roosevelt was in charge of running the U.S. Navy. 
He resigned this post to lead his famous Rough Riders in a campaign in Cuba. At war's end, he was elected as governor of New York, and then as William McKinley's vice presidential running mate for the Republican Party. McKinley was re-elected as president in March of 1900 and was killed by an assassin's bullet in September 1901. Roosevelt would become the 26th president of the United States, the next seminal moment for conservation. With the bully pulpit, Roosevelt and his brotherhood of sportsmen took aim at building a working model for conservation that had laws, had funding, had the science it needed to guide the right decisions, was supported by expert agencies led by trained professionals, and was built not just for the day, but to withstand the test of time. Tomorrow is what weighed most on Roosevelt's mind. Boone and Crockett Country has been brought to you by Leupold, America's Optics Authority, and the Boone and Crockett Club, fair chase and conservation since 1887. Theodore Roosevelt once said, the object of government is the welfare of the people. Conservation means development as much as it does protection. I recognize the right and duty of this generation to develop and use the natural resources of our land, but I do not recognize the right to waste them or to rob by wasteful use the generations that come after us. Theodore Roosevelt, 1910. Alongside Roosevelt remained his fellow members in the Boone and Crockett Club, whom he relied upon heavily to identify problems and formulate solutions. Some he positioned within his administration as knights on a chessboard. Gifford Pinchot would become the first chief of the Forest Service. Congressman John F. Lacey, Senators George Vest and Thomas B. Carter, Secretaries of the Interior, Lamar and Noble, General Philip Sheridan and Arnold Haig of U.S. Geological Survey supplied the political influence. Behind them all, including Roosevelt, was George Bird Grinnell. Roosevelt is given the credit in history as the father of conservation, but much of his ideas, actions, and policies were inspired by Grinnell, who was the editor and publisher of Forest and Stream magazine, now Field and Stream. When Roosevelt took office, the contemporary thinking on natural resource matters was that of protection and preservation. Through his discussions with Grinnell, conservation became the keynote of his administration. The word soon appeared in dictionaries defined as prudent use without waste. Roosevelt's administration produced a federal natural resource program that was balanced between economic development and aesthetic preservation. The barrage of conservation policy and laws continued throughout Roosevelt's presidency. Of lasting significance, before Roosevelt was done, he designated 150 national forests, the first 51 federal bird reservations, five national parks, the 18 national monuments, the first four national game preserves, and the first 21 reclamation projects. Altogether, he provided federal protection for almost 230 million acres a land area equivalent to all that of the East Coast states from Maine to Florida. In seven years, while in office, more progress was made in natural resource management than the nation had seen in a century or has seen since. I believe that TR would be proud of such things as the recovery of wildlife, the opportunity for the public to still freely hunt and fish, and the lands he set aside for the people still relatively intact. I think he would be concerned about those activities that are blocking public access to wildlife, children spending less time outdoors, and the reemergence of preservationist attitudes that are offering a different model for non-use by the public. Roosevelt knew blocking public access for fish and wildlife would have been disastrous then. He would think the same way today. The vision and accomplishments of Theodore Roosevelt are staggering when viewed end to end. He was a renaissance man, a naturalist, a lover of all things wild, a husband, father, a patriot, and a hunter. He is the only U.S. president that has a trophy listed in the Boone and Crockett records, a then world record cougar. Yet many might forget his deep fascination with, knowledge of, and love for songbirds as one of his strongest conservation commitments. As I mentioned earlier, it is impossible to list all that Roosevelt has given us, 
But if I had to pick just one thing, one thing we need to bring back in this country now more than ever, it is his belief that conservation is an individual's responsibility of citizenship. As sportsmen, we should know and live this principle more than anyone. But alone, we are not enough. The growing size of human populations and the pressures our mere existence places on the environment demands that every individual be conservation-minded and give back to the environment in some way, regardless of where we live, work, or recreate. Thanks again for watching. I'm Shane Mahoney.